New alarm bells ringing tonight on the coronavirus outbreak in this country. Doctors say the virus is spread through droplets when someone coughs or sneezes. And I think the business community, it's in their interest that people actually stay home and stop the spread. For a business that can allow more employees to telecommute, we want you to do that. Hi, friends. I'm Andy Paul, host of the Sales Enablement Podcast. And I want to encourage you to listen to my brand new special six-part podcast miniseries titled Selling with Purpose. The team behind Sales Enablement Podcast and I put together this incredible series of inspiring conversations exploring what it means to sell with a mission greater than just hitting your numbers in this era of COVID-19 and beyond. So tune in to hear from world-class enterprise sales leaders and learn how their six companies will close $50 billion selling remotely. See how they've supported essential workers with the products and services they need to stay safe and thrive during this time of crisis. Subscribe to Selling with a Purpose now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Guided selling from Ring DNA makes your entire sales team more effective by revealing exactly what reps should do and when to do it. Guided selling works by transforming sales data into a curated list of prioritized sales actions. So when reps start their day, they'll never again wonder which prospects and accounts or hot inbound leads to reach out to next. Guided selling even shifts reps' priority in response to real-time buying signals. Finally, even new reps can sell like seasoned ones. Let Ring DNA be your guide to success. Learn more at ringdna.com slash guided selling. That's ringdna.com slash guided selling. It's time to accelerate. Hey friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 755 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record. Joining me as my guest this week is Mary Grothy. Mary is the CEO and founder of Sales BQ an outsourced revenue operations company. And among the topics we're going to talk about are the top three attributes Mary believes sellers need to have in order to succeed in today's environment, including a relentless pursuit of winning, uh, hating to lose, and this inner desire to compete and be number one. Mary and I are also going to get into why you need to be able to sell with passion, conviction, and enthusiasm, and we'll get into details about how to do that. It's all very interesting. And before we get to that, uh, we're going to talk for a minute with my friend William Tyree. William's coming back for the third time. William's the CMO of Ring DNA, and we're going to be talking about Ring DNA's Sales Madness Bracket Challenge. So we just moved into round 16, the sweet 16, if you will. If you're longing for some non virus related madness this March, then, well, actually, now in April, I guess, then you want to check out the Bracket Challenge. Today, we're previewing, previewing the Sweet 16 key matchup. So, and it's also not too late to vote. We'll talk about that when William joins us. So, William, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Great to be here. Great to be anywhere. <laughs> and anywhere is where? Anywhere is Los Angeles. <laughs> Los Angeles. Okay. All right. So, we're back to talk about the March Madness, Sales Madness Bracket Challenge, our version of March Madness. And today, we're going to preview the matchups in the round of 16, the sweet 16. Hopefully that doesn't <laughs> intrude on base trademark. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. We've got, um, you know, we had some Cinderella stories kind of coming through from the first two rounds. We've got some great matchups. Um, you know, one of, I think, the, the toughest match, uh, matchups among those Cinderella stories is going to be High Profit Prospecting, which was a 41 seed going up against Daniel Pink's To Sell is Human. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that that um, here's my bias, which I, I revealed last week. It's, yeah, I've got a, in this competition, I mean, mm -hmm. I love To Sell is Human, but my bias is in favor of sales books, books that are actually sales books for salespeople. And I right. think High Profit Prospecting fits in that, fits in that mold. So, if I was leaning in a direction, I'd, I'd recommend uh, high-profit prospecting. Yeah, I, I think that reasoning is sound. Um, you know, we've seen some uh, uh, enthusiasm and passion for those kind of big bucket, big tent books that also cross over into sales. We've got a few of them that have survived. 
Um, so it'll be interesting to see if uh, Daniel Pink's book, you know, makes it to the Elite Eight. Um, you know, another one of those that that just keeps advancing are starting to look unstoppable, unstoppable, which is that number one seed, how to win friends and influence people. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a reason for that. Okay. So if you're listening to this on April 2nd, when it's released, then you've got uh, opportunities to vote for Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight. And then we'll announce the final four uh, right before next week's episode gets released on the 8th. We'll do the preview of the final four that you'll hear on the show. And then we'll announce the voting for the final four and the finals on that show. That's right. And they can do that at ringdna.com forward slash sales madness. Ringdna.com forward slash sales madness. Okay, William, one more after this. This is getting exciting. And it's, I mean, you can't argue about any of the books that have made it through so far. And certainly, all 64 were worthwhile, but um, yeah, voters are doing a good job so far. They are. I mean, we nitpick, we critique, but there's no question there's so much value in these 16 books. And congrats to all the authors that have made it. All right, William, till next week. All right, thank you. All right, William, thanks, friends. Again, go fill out your brackets. Actually, go vote, excuse me, today at ringdna.com forward slash sales madness. That's ringdna.com forward slash sales madness. Okay, let's jump into it. Mary, welcome to Accelerate. Thank you for having me. Well, pleasure to have you here. So, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. You're based where? I'm out of Denver, and I've lived out here for 20 years or so, originally from the Midwest, but came out here in my high school years and had a really great opportunity to be forced to have to work at a young age, <laughs> like it's my, it's my childhood, which is fine, and got a head start on a lot of my, my friends and peers. I, I ended up landing a job at 22 years old with a big payroll and HR company called Paychecks. Sure. And I started there at 22, didn't have my college degree yet, but I got to study underneath the first, I guess, I guess one of the highest performing mid-market sales managers in the country. And it was a remarkable time that division had only been around for about uh, seven years or so. Mm-hmm. And I got to work with the number one sales manager and number one team. I did two years as an admin knew I wanted to get into sales. It looked exciting. And I learned as much of the trade as possible just by getting out in the field and listening to Brian Tracy's Psychology of Selling on a cassette tape (laughs) back then, 11 cassette tape series, and took two Dale Carnegie courses that I just loved. Went out into the field, started selling at 24 years old, and I became the number one rep in 30 days. It was a really, really fun sales career. I sold for three years. And was the number one rep for the first two years mm-hmm. in sales. And I loved about that is I just didn't know any different. And the crazy part looking back is that was 2008 and 2009. Interesting timing for this conversation about being sure. a high-performing sales rep during, in a down economy. But I loved it. And I just had such a knack for it. I, I got a really cool opportunity to work with Mike McCarthy, who was the VP of sales the division was three hundred million on a one point seven billion dollar paychecks at the time, and he asked for my help to rewrite processes and the methodology, and even talk down to compensation modeling and revenue share mm-hmm. between divisions and conversations that I, a normal, I guess, at, at early stage in a career, 25, 26 year old probably wouldn't be having. But then that really piqued my interest. And I wanted to get into more business strategy and revenue strategy. Mm -hmm. I left paychecks and I set out to conquer the world of building revenue for, for companies. And I had my first business for three years and started that in 2011. It was a great first run, made a lot of rookie mistakes as an entrepreneur and I went back to paychecks for three years, sold millions. I got married, had a baby. And then at that point in 2017, I said, all right, I've grown up. I've matured. I'm a little bit smarter this time around. And I have a few more sales years under my belt. Mm-hmm. I think that I'm better equipped. So we started Sales BQ and we're a firm now. We, we stretch coast to coast. And we help build revenue strategies and execute upon them for B2B companies that are about five to 20 million in revenue. So outsource sales efforts, outsourced 
sales management as well? We start with building the revenue funnel mm-hmm. and we focus on marketing, sales, sales ops, and customer success. So we follow the revenue through the whole customer journey and we do it in three phases, build, hire, drive. We will first rebuild infrastructure, systems, processes, of course, the tech stack, automate things that should be automated. And then we will hire the talent or develop the existing talent internally. And then we stick around for it to be profitable. And that's our drive phase. My team goes on contract with these CEOs as a VP of revenue operations and or head of revenue. And they'll oversee the entire function of the new revenue engine we built on a period of about 6 to 12 months to prove it out and make sure that they're making a lot of money. (laughs) Okay. So um, what is behavioral quotient. That's the BQ of sales BQ. So sales behavioral quotient. So what is that? The BQ, the behavioral quotient. This is something that was very important to me because people asked me hundreds of times during those very high performing years at Paychex, what makes me different? Why am I selling more than number two and three combined? Why am I breaking all these records when really I didn't feel like there was anything special about me? I was showing up and doing my job. Mm -hmm. And I thought, why can't other people sell this way? Isn't this how everybody goes about it? And they really tried to study me and break apart my process and to see what it was that I was doing well. And I broke it into these three components. One, it's the IQ component. It's understanding the product, the industry, the marketplace, the day in the life of the buyer, how you solve their problems. And I've written a couple of blogs on this, but it's all about being able to express passion, conviction, and enthusiasm and really know your stuff because people buy from people that give them a sense of comfort by knowing what the heck they're talking about Mm -hmm. and truly ability to solve their problem and move the needle for them. And so that was a passion of mine was knowing my technology and how it served different industries and types of buyers. The second component was an emotional intelligence component, EQ, which was being a great human being and really bringing a human component into the sales conversation, not selling at them, not showing up and doing a pitch and word vomiting and getting out of there. It was truly connecting at an emotional level because I quickly found that people bought emotionally and they justified that buying decision logically. But if you had the emotional connection, people were more prone to buy and there are ways to create that. But even if you have those two pieces, you can be wicked smart and you can be an amazing human being and offer great connection with your buyer. But you actually have to show up and do the work every single day. Mm -hmm. And that's the BQ. And that's the behavioral quotient. It is a salesperson's commitment to showing up every single day and doing whatever they need to do ethically in order to succeed. And it's tiny decisions. It's prioritization. It's the get up and go. It's avoiding procrastination. It's being organized. It's time blocking. It's pre-call planning. It's not working harder than you need to. It's being focused on having a high close rate by following a very good pristine process. And it's about doing the work that needs to be done in order to win not doing the work and saying, I did it at the level that was expected of me or doing enough to get by or to fly under the radar. And I felt like BQ is what set me apart from my colleagues. Okay. Well, then there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> I was just trying to take that all in. So um, let's talk about your pristine process to close. So what, what was that? Oh, boy. How much time do we have? <laughs> take as much as you need. It all comes down to selling the way the buyer needs to be sold to. And I'm going to break that down further. Each buyer has their buying criteria. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can generalize that based on their title. Is buying criteria the same as purchase criteria or systems criteria? Sure. I mean, yes. I mean some it, could be yes. a decision criteria about this is what the vendor needs to have and needs to be in this price point, which is different than, hey, the features we need. Correct. I think decision criteria is a, is a separate component of this. I think when you look at the individual buyer, so working in the mid-market sale, on an average sale, I would have three, four, or five decision makers, influencers, team mm-hmm. members, and users, functionaries as a part of the buying team. Sure. And if I was able to get laser focused on every single quote unquote buyers or prospects buying criteria, because Nancy and HR was buying for different reasons than Susan and payroll versus Mike and finance and CEO, Susan or whatever, Mm -hmm. Kathy, we'll call her. Everybody had 
a different role and they had different buying criteria. And with the different buying criteria, if you, if you all say you ask me, I would get laser focused on how every single person needed to be heard, valued, how their criteria needed to be evaluated, what type of proof of concept I needed to give them, and what kind of human connection I needed to create with each of these people in order for them to say, we're buying from Mary. Mm -hmm. And I heard it time and time and time and time again throughout my career in the multitude of things that I've sold, that people are buying from me because I'm standing apart from every other product or service. And thinking about... I have bought, of course, as a consumer, but also as a CEO, I've purchased a lot of things in my life. And there have been moments where I need the product or service, but I don't like the salesperson. Sure. And it pains me to know that they're going to get commission on my sale because I don't like them. So if you don't think there's weight in how much someone actually likes you as part of the sales process and liking you is a product of doing right by them and answering the what's in it for me and solving their challenges and speaking their language and aligning with their needs. And as a reminder, not everybody's this touchy feely, be my best friend. If you look at the disc scale and you're selling to a D, I'm not building rapport with that person the same way I'm building rapport with an I or an S. I'm going to get down to business. I'm going to speak their love language that has to do with driving bottom line and results. It's going to be a completely different conversation than someone else on the other end of the spectrum. So when I think about this top-notch process of selling and converting deals, I would say that I would prioritize every single buyer within the equation and make sure everybody's needs were met across the board because I wasn't blind to the fact that they had meetings when I wasn't there. They had phone calls, they had email exchanges that I wasn't a part of. So what was I doing in the precious 30, 60, 90, however many minutes that I Mm -hmm. had with them? And then the follow through and communication in between the steps of my sales process. What was I bringing forth that hands down, they would say, we are buying for Mary. Like, I don't care. I mean, sure, that other company, technology may have showed a little bit better in this area, but I feel comfortable with her. I'm buying from her. So, uh, yeah, this whole thing's not, this is the whole idea that people buy from people, certainly nothing, nothing new, right? Mm-hmm. But it is increasingly seemingly a, a elusive um, skill set to develop in in sellers to learn how to connect with another human being on an authentic basis. What what is in your mind to serve the the key to doing that? Because this is this is fundamental. As to your point, if you can't do this, everything else that you, flows after it is going to be affected by it. It is. I think about people showing up to do sales, and it's almost as if they turn into a different person because now they're doing sales. And I look at how a human being connects with another human being. Maybe they're a friend, maybe it's a colleague or a family member, seeing how that person communicates with people that they care about, and then seeing how that person communicates in a business setting. And sometimes there's so much formality, there's fear that's driving a different type of language coming out of their mouth. They're focusing on their training, their techniques, their skills. If their manager's listening in or the call's being recorded, they're focusing on the talk tracks that they're using and progression, and they're stripping out the ability to just have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you're talking about how do two people genuinely build, we work with a lot of BDR teams and I love them. I love top of funnel. I'm a hunter I'm not a nurturer Mm -hmm. and I'm also a high D I'm a DI on the disc scale. And I like, I'm very, very high urgency and fast pace. And because of, I'm sure you couldn't tell, but because of that, there's there's the part that was going unspoken, but yes, go ahead. (laughs) As part of that, it's typically hard for me to build rapport and to build relationships. And I empathize with BDRs. It's sometimes it's difficult over the phone, over email and top of funnels where you get shut down a lot unless your messaging is really great or timing is good. And so I love working with those teams because they're in this mindset, especially if it's a BDR team that they're, they're younger in their career and they're really cutting their teeth and figuring out sales and they're following these scripts and steps and processes. And one of my favorite things to do with them is to teach them the why behind what they're Mm -hmm. saying and Mm -hmm. how it falls and resonates with the buyer and to create more of that human connection through just being genuine and having a conversation. I actually, this is a funny story. I was sitting at a public sales seminar and someone stood in front of the room, a a sales leader who was showing a technology and he played two different sound bites. 
And one was a BDR who followed a script. Mm -hmm. The second was a BDR that was just natural and having conversation and fell off the script a few times. And what was very, very interesting is the sales leader was going in, he was showing off a a recording technology that he really believed in and and also a back-end process. And he was waiting for the audience to, to rate the two calls, which one was better. And he was going for the the scripted, recorded, followed a process call was better. And by overwhelming response, the audience voted that the other call was better. And it shocked him. And he didn't know where to lead the rest of his presentation. (laughs) And it was at that moment, what stood out for me, and that was about two and a half years ago, close to when we started Sales BQ. And it stood out for me to realize nothing, no scripting process and whatnot, if we can train, especially this younger generation that's grown up on so much technology and they don't really use phones and they don't, they're not great at eye contact and confrontation. And if we can train them to bring back human conversation and connection, I think that we can really arm them to be powerful. And so some of the work that we do with our BDRs is getting them to have more natural conversations, asking better questions, and then knowing where to pivot and navigate based on the buyer responses and bringing more of that gentle human conversation into the call. So to encourage that, what's a better question? To encourage what? And in that the opening call? Yeah, the opening call, yeah. You know, it just depends. I, we custom write these for all of our for all of our clients. But I can give you an example. So we've got one right now that's working in the world of digital advertising mm-hmm. and in OTT and CTV and programmatic and there's with what's happening in our society right now and our in our economy and everything with the coronavirus there's been a huge shift and a lot of their clients were pausing ad spend mm-hmm. and freaking out like we have sure. to conserve cash we can't spend money and so the sales team immediately felt like well we can't make outbound calls because who's going to buy from us right now everybody is stopping and it's like well wait a second what are all these people who are stuck working from home doing they're streaming. Sure. <laughs> what do you sell? <laughs> Let's have a different conversation. And so in order to cut through the challenges that we're having right now, we're having them open up with a conversation and they're calling direct to agencies, advertising agencies that may or may not have this specialty or skill set internally. And so they're able to white label it, if you will, and bring it forth to their clients. But they're opening up with a question of curiosity and empathy leading in towards what's happening. What, how has this impacted your business? Hey, we're in the same boat. We're all, this is who we are. Talk to me about your agency right now. How is this impacted? What are you feeling from it being paused? What has leadership told you? So these are bigger, bolder questions. And this is a specific example with what's going on in our society today. But if you think about a regular outbound call, um, uh, hey, Andy, this is Mary over at ABC Advertising. We're a digital advertising firm that focuses on OTT, CTV, and other programmatic uh, advertising methods. Do you have 15 to 20 minutes for us to talk about your needs in advertising, what you've done historically? The answer is probably going to be no. But if I'm opening up and saying, Andy, you may not um, have heard our name. We're ABC Advertising. We're out of uh, Colorado. My name's Mary. You weren't expecting my call. I know we're in a very interesting time right now. May I take a moment and tell you why I'm calling? And then you gain that permission to have the opening call Mm -hmm. and say, and then you can open it up from that point. Once you get the permission to tell them why you're calling, we, we work with hundreds of advertising agencies across the country. And within the last week, we've had uh, at least five dozen notifications to pause or cancel campaigns. What's happening in your business right now? Because I think we've come up with a creative way that we might be able to help you with the stop gap on revenue so you don't experience such a huge loss. Can you tell me what you've had happen just in the past week? What's happening with your campaigns? So we're opening up and we're having a question that's built off of human interaction, a trigger event, and it's about empathy and curiosity. And it's not pushing an agenda on a salesperson's side. That Mm -hmm. is an outbound message that's going to get somebody that feels like, okay, wait, you understand what's going on. You're bringing me something of value. And this is pressing right now because it's related to a trigger event. No matter where your sales team is working from, Ring DNA can enable them to be more productive and effective. Ring DNA offers a complete platform for remote sales teams that gives reps the tools they need to connect with more prospects and create more opportunities and drive more revenue no matter where they're working from. And managers can get real-time insight they need to coach reps to success. Win more deals from anywhere on the planet with Ring DNA. 
Learn more about how Ring DNA helps remote teams at ringdna.com slash remote work. That's ringdna.com slash remote work. New alarm bells ringing tonight on the coronavirus outbreak in this country. Doctors say the virus is spread through droplets when someone coughs or sneezes. And I think the business community, it's in their interest that people actually stay home and stop the spread. For a business that can allow more employees to telecommute, we want you to do that. Hi, friends. I'm Andy Paul, host of the Sales Enablement Podcast, and I want to encourage you to listen to my brand new special six-part podcast miniseries titled Selling with Purpose. The team behind Sales Enablement Podcast and I put together this incredible series of inspiring conversations exploring what it means to sell with a mission greater than just hitting your numbers in this era of COVID-19 and beyond. So tune in to hear from world-class enterprise sales leaders and learn how their six companies will close $50 billion selling remotely. See how they've supported essential workers with the products and services they need to stay safe and thrive during this time of crisis. Subscribe to Selling with a Purpose now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Well, I mean, I think that's that's a great example. And it, it, but it seems like, to my experience, is, is that what we're seeing is that and you touched on earlier, is that reps are feeling this pressure, right? I've got so mm-hmm. many things I need to do. I've got, you know, X number of conversations I need to set up. That means X number of dials. I've got so many emails I need to set up. And it just becomes easier in their mind or safer in their mind just to default to sort of the, the script. So how do, you, how do you work with teams to overcome this tendency? And it really the, it starts at the top, right? Because I, mm-hmm. increasingly, with the way that inside sales is implemented it's it's become about compliance right we've got a process we've got scripts Mm -hmm. sales really has been reduced to a game of chance right if we just do this often enough we're going to get a certain number of results which isn't sustainable right so so Mm -hmm. how do you how do you start at the top with the manager say look we want to develop the individual capabilities of of the sales team right we want to have everybody be able to perform to the best of their abilities because in aggregate that's going to help you more how do you get the sales manager to sort of open their eyes and lay off and say, yeah, let's, let's take a different focus on this. I'm going to hit on two things that you said there. One, the reason that we default to scripts is if we don't have it built, if we don't have the neural pathways built in our mind and we haven't stored that data in long-term memory, it, I'll explain. When you're under pressure or you're triggered or you're not sure what to do, you'll fall back on what you've always known. And so if you're training just scripts, <laughs> Those might be memorized and that's what they know and that's where their comfort level is. And so if a call is going in a direction or someone says something or they're triggered, they're going to fall back on what they know. Now, if you can train capabilities like you're talking about to be of the same level of importance, that's also what gets stored in long-term memory. Early in my sales career, I was flown out to beautiful Rochester, New York. Thankfully, beautiful. after the blizzards were done, mm-hmm. but it actually is very pretty. It up is there. very pretty. Area. And right I lake. got to... Yes, yes. I got to stay up there for two weeks with 20 of my new best friends, <laughs> reps across the country being promoted into sales. And the first thing they had us do was to memorize the paycheck story. And I had it memorized to the point that I still remember it today. Paychex was founded in 1971 <laughs> by B. Thomas Galisano <laughs> with $300 yeah, in yeah. his pocket in his garage, right? So this traditional founder story and I memorized is probably two pages long and I memorized the entire story. I also then memorized as we were learning the technology, not just the feature and functionality, but I was memorizing the word tracks, the scripting that the trainer was training us. So I knew what to say when we hit different features. But then more importantly, when we were listening to actual client conversations, so when I got back into the field, because I memorized all those data points, but it's very one-sided. Mm-hmm. But then when I got into the field and I started selling, what I started to memorize were client questions and client responses of what was important to them. How is what you know? How are these scripts? How are these questions? How are these answers? Why is that important? And if we can memorize the why behind it and build the capabilities around having a conversation behind the why is this important, I feel like that's the training that's missing. And in fact, one of our BDR teams right now has a new VP of sales and 
we are brought in specifically to work with the BDR team, not the rest of the sales organization. And this is a very talented VP of sales. He has done turnaround. He has um, been brought in by private equity. He's very, very good. And we sat down together and I looked at him in the eye and said, I'm going to train, well, not me personally, but my VP, we're going to focus on training this BDR team to have frame of reference to understand the why behind the product that you sell, how it makes someone's life better, different use cases, how companies are, I want them to be able to say, you know, I haven't spent a lot of time in manufacturing quite early in my career, but what you just said reminds me of another manufacturing client that we had. Let me run this past you, what we did for them, and let's have a conversation to see if that resonates. We were able to automate A, B, and C, which resulted in Mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z, and this was extremely well, received by the organization. And this is where we took them. Now tell me, what are some of those processes that you have internally? Are they similar to this? Or, or by telling the story, does it evoke something inside of you to think of an idea that we can talk about? And he's looking at me like I'm nuts. Because <laughs> you can't train a BDR to have a conversation like that. And I said, you can watch me. Sure. We will train the BDRs to have conversations like that because they need to do, have meaningful conversations. This is a first impression. This is the first line of defense with a prospect. Why are we not empowering them with capabilities to have powerful conversations on the front end? Because then otherwise they're just a glorified appointment setter. And why don't you just automate that through your marketing? But right. if you want great first point of conversation, train up this team to be brilliant in that. And it's really not that hard. And they're really honestly eager for it. Because nobody likes to not know the next answer or why they don't want to know. They don't want to have fear of where do I take this call? What do I say next? Sure. So another approach, and I was just having a conversation with somebody about this this earlier today, is why don't we hire more experienced people into the BDR slash SDR role? I mean, right now, we just use it to serve, quite frankly, cannon fodder for the most part. Yeah, we're going to hire a bunch of people in those roles and those that survive, great. Those that don't, we wash them out. But... Why not look at uh, uh, having this conversation with Aaron Ross, who wrote Predictable Revenue today, is, is, yeah, why not start paying SDRs the way you'd pay an AE? Yeah, I would absolutely have, I would absolutely love to be a BDR. I'm a hunter, and I absolutely believe that there are talented individuals far into their careers that have proven out that they're brilliant in the opening prospecting conversation absolutely, and why you would not pay uh, even a hundred thousand dollar base salary for the best of the best in the business that's able to convert at 3x 4x 10x of initial conversations into a qualified opportunity right why organizations are willing to spend countless dollars in turnover and churn through entry level without training i mean some of this entry level talent i was entry level talent but I got all the training in the world and I had mentorship and development and people that cared about me. And I know that's why I am where I am well, today. But I would argue that in large part, based on you and I have never met before this call, but based on listening to you, I would say you are where you are because you listen to your customers. I mean, we fundamentally yeah. learn how to sell from our customers. We don't learn how to sell from sales training. And so you, yeah. you listen. <laughs> and this is what people I think that are more mature have had that experience yeah, it's not to say that we don't need an entry level sales job. We absolutely do. Maybe it's inbound leads, just aren't inbound leads. But sure. you know, there's this bias against people that have experience because what happens is so many managers default to quantity, right? We need to have you know, so many dials, so many emails, so many conversations. And they think that you know, anybody that's been in it for more than five, 10 years is burnt out or they're too old to do it or whatever, right? And yet there's mm-hmm. these great resources, to your point. People I know, you obviously have met some in your career. I've met more because I've been a little bit longer, who are just brilliant to that. Why mm-hmm. not let these people do that? And then we, we shorten the cycle for many companies. I couldn't agree more. With one of our clients in Southern California, that's the exact approach that we took. We brought somebody in who is uh, very late into his career, and he is a true prospecting machine Mm -hmm. and he's brilliant in it and you should hear him on the phone because you can tell how seasoned and knowledgeable he is and he's i'm i'm hyped up he's calm and he's (laughs) so kind and genuine and curious on these calls and he has lower number of outbound dials per week 
because his calls are so good. He's keeping people on the phone and he's got a phenomenal conversion rate. He's more expensive, but you know what? They had in their budget to have two or three SDRs and he's hitting the metrics for all three of them. It's just one person and he's brilliant in it. And of course now he's spoiled everyone. Maybe how do we find another one? Hire another one just like him. Exactly. Yeah, so I do believe 100% what you said. I think for the right organization, that is the better strategy. Yeah, I think more organizations need to look at them. I think I think several things are playing to that. One is sort of immaturity on the level at the management level. I mean, if you've got very inexperienced managers, they don't have the self confidence to hire people they think maybe know more than they do. I mean, sure. you clearly do. I'm sure that. I was looking at your staff on your your team. You've got people that have some gray hair in there, um, so you're not afraid of that. But that does hold a lot of people back, right? Is is well, I can't hire this person because you know they may know more than I do, and I can't have that. Well, that's a shame because I learned the hard way my first three years of owning a business, starting at age 27. Right. That. Actually, maybe I was 26. Uh, now that I think about it, maybe 26 and a half. I don't remember. But I had a terrible ego back then. And I had come off of being the number one salesperson. I was making a, a very uh, wonderful income. I had a lot of praise, recognition. I had a very big head. And I thought I knew everything. And I thought, no one can do it as good as me. Mm-hmm. So I started a business where I'm doing everyone's job. And I'm the only one that can do everything. And it became very tiring and very exhausting. And it was also limiting me from scaling. I didn't know how to recruit. I didn't know how to hire. I didn't know how to delegate a lot of rookie mistakes made in that. The second time around, thankfully, I had the opportunity to go through those three years. And I said, I don't have as much energy as I used to. And now I'm married with a baby. I don't have time for that. I'm not working (laughs) 20 hour days. And I knew I had to do something different. And that was all in hiring brilliant people. Additionally, I do business development for the company. And I was running into this problem. I'd sell the account and the CEO would look at me and say, and you're handling this, right? Mm -hmm. I say, no, 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 no. It's going to go to a VP on my team. And there was a big disconnect there and a lot of concern. And so when I started to bring the VPs into the conversation, sit down in front of them, and they'd realize these people are brilliant. And in many, many cases, they're far more talented than I am. And I consider that to be the biggest win. And I wish more managers would look at it that way. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck doing the heavy lifting and be the one on the chopping block when your team doesn't perform. Why don't you just make it easy on yourself and be a great producer and produce a great show? Yeah, it seems to be a message that's hard for for managers to get across to managers, and it's always been the case. But I I don't say it's any worse today than it's ever been. But it's this idea is that you only succeed if your people succeed, and so if there's a moment in your day that you're not devoting to helping your people get better, what are you doing? Surfing the internet. Yeah, no, but I mean that's. <laughs> but I, I mean, what's happened? So many managers now, with because we have the tools and technology that give us so much transparency into the activities that people mm-hmm. are undertaking, the sellers undertaking, as we become fixated with metrics, and while they're vitally important, is you know it's still a people game. It is, and so there's this reluctance. I remember sitting at this conference a couple of years ago. I tell the story probably too often on the show about. VP CROs of tech companies, SaaS companies, sitting up on a dais at a at a uh, convention conference, and talking about the fact that more than one of them that they don't do one on ones anymore. I find they don't work. It's like, well, I don't think the issue is the one on one itself. I think the issue is you. And um, yet, people think they can get by just looking at the numbers, and it's you can't. How do I'm just shocked with that statement. One on ones for me, that is precious time. That's yeah. development time. That's connection time. That's just getting raw in mm-hmm. how do we serve you? How do we help you? What is getting in your way? What do you need? It's a moment too for pride and excitement out of a salesperson to share their wins and to get the feedback and to be fed through recognition and acknowledging their efforts and making that person acknowledged and feeling that they 
have earned their spot on that team and that you're fighting for them, that one-on-one time is precious. Right. So I what, can't believe that. Well, A, believe it. But B, <laughs> if we were to play back your answer, and this is really significant, what's the one thing you didn't say takes place in that one-on-one? Reviewing their numbers? Exactly. And this I is, already this, know their numbers because we implement great technology. Right. I don't need someone to read me a report that I've already read. And so you got all this talk in the sales industry about we got to do more coaching of our people. We got to do more coaching of our people. And what the overwhelming majority of sales managers think coaching is, is opportunity coaching. We're going to work through this deal. And it's like, no, no, that doesn't help your person get better. How do you help your person get better? What, what do they need from you, to your point before us, in order to achieve their goals? How can we help them get better? And, and that just doesn't enter the equation for most, most managers when they're having their one-on-ones. They think it's about, what are we going to close? And it's Correct, because that's what's coming from the top down to them, and they're missing right. the point of the conversation. They're having it, they're, they're focusing on the wrong end of the problem, Because I know with my manager, the way that I was believed in and mentored and developed and cared for as a human being did more good than grilling me on the numbers. And because the investment was made in me as a human being and setting me up for success, sure, of course, we talked about deals. We talked about uh, sticky situations, progressing. Mm -hmm. What do I do? I just... Oh gosh, this decision maker out of the blue came in. I, I didn't know. What do we do? Okay, there's there's that. But somebody believed in me. And if I didn't have that mental mindset is everything. And that's the BQ wheel that we work on. How you think fuels how you feel. And your emotional state triggers mm-hmm. your actions. And those actions dictate your performance. And then that's the BQ wheel. And if you're not investing in the mental mindset, you're not getting your people's head right, which is going to trigger their emotions, which will dictate their actions. If you're constantly hitting the performance, that's the fourth part in the wheel. You got to start at the top and work on mental mindset so that they're in the game and they're feeling cared for because the mental mindset will trigger their emotional state. And I don't know about about you, but for me, as an emotional person, especially as a woman, I am with my person personality style, I can get worked up easily. And I know (laughs) that it's always, (laughs) it's always based on the thoughts going on in my head. And I do something with those thoughts. I make a decision on the thoughts on how I'm going to interpret them and what story I'm telling myself Right. because of the facts that came into my mind. Like I'm looking at it snow right now. I'm looking at snow and you know what? I'm home the rest of the day. So I'm looking at the snow and the thought here is, wow, It's beautiful outside. Look at that snow. And then the emotional feeling is I am so thankful right now that I get to work from home and gosh, it feels so good to be in and hunker down. Then what do you think my actions are? Well, I'm ready to work. I'm ready to get things done. I'm inside on this snowy day. I can't go out. I'm so thankful to be able to work from home. And then what's my performance going to be? It's going to be really good. But if I looked out the window and I look at this snow and let's say my day was different. I had to go out in it. And I'm like, I can't drive in this. Time. I'm going to cancel my meetings. I can't, I don't know what I'm going to do. Let me check all the news reports. Well, now I'm reading 50 other news reports that have devastating news in them. And now I'm this emotional state's coming in. This is throwing a wrench in my mm-hmm. day. This is absolutely terrible. What happens to my actions? I might be canceling meetings. I'm not emotionally prepared for my meetings. I'm in a bad mood. My execution isn't where it needs to be. I'm off my game. And then my performance is lowered. All that happened is it snowed today. Right. Why are there two wildly different outcomes? And that's human nature. And that's how we are as human beings. And as a manager, if you're not managing the mental state and you're only focused on the performance component, you've missed the entire wheel. Yeah. Well, I was telling you, your wheel is, is, um, shares a lot in common with a favorite quote of mine that I've had up in my house for ages and ages from Vince Lombardi. If you remember Vince Lombardi, he was the coach of the Green Bay Packers back in the 60s. I grew up in Wisconsin at that time. And he was a real quote machine. Um, but he has this quote, and I can send it to you after. It's, but it's almost reads like a poem. It says, winning is a habit. Watch your thoughts, they become your beliefs. Watch your beliefs, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits. They become your character. Nice, Ooh. huh? Cause that's, that's a good one. Yeah, but I mean, you have three or four of those lines from, in, your, in your wheel from that. Um, 
And it's really important. I think is is we have to. There's so many elements in there. It's, you know, obviously, thoughts leading to beliefs, beliefs leading to actions, actions leading to words, uh, or words leading to actions. Excuse me, and actions leading to habits. But then, the sum of all that is our character. And this gets back to how we're initially perceived by our our buyers, right? I mean, that first conversation we have, they are forming a perception of who you are as a person, your character, very quickly. And very quickly, and. That's the sum total of all these other things, right? Those other things that don't happen after that, they're, they lead up to it. And very important for, as you're looking at developing yourself as an individual, or if you're a manager, working with your people, is, is this is a sort of a hierarchy. And it's like a very similar to wheel. I think that you have to keep in mind. Cool, huh? All right. So, it's amazing. This has been a lot of fun. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but um, we'll have to make sure to do this again. We didn't get to any of the questions I had lined up to ask you. Oh my goodness. There's going to be a part two. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want, I think that, uh, yeah, it was great to meet you and great to hear what you, you're doing. And, and, uh, obviously yeah, a lot of what you're talking about, I think resonates and will resonate with a lot of people because it's, uh, it's, yeah, sales is about people and, uh, that's, that's fundamentally what you're, you're focused on and that's the way we succeed. So Mary, Great to meet you. Hopefully you do well in the snow and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks for having me on today. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, friends, that was Accelerate for the week. First of all, as always, I want to thank you for joining me. And I want to thank my guest, Mary Grothy. Join me again next week as my guest will be Jeff Shore. Jeff's going to be back, I think, for the third time on the show. And we're going to talk all about follow-up. In particular, how do you follow up with a buyer who isn't quite ready to move forward on your schedule? How do you follow up and stay engaged while continuing to maintain that connection and providing significant value that helps the buyer stay informed until they are ready to move forward, until they are ready to re-engage? So definitely want to check this out. Be sure to join Jeff and me next week for that conversation. So again, thanks for joining me this week on Accelerate. Until next week, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. RingDNA is the leading sales enablement platform that uses AI to help scale business growth. Trusted by the top companies across the globe, RingDNA offers a suite of powerful tools for every sales role. The RingDNA dialer radically improves sales productivity and call connection rates, while guided selling helps reps know exactly what to do and when to do it. Conversation AI uses artificial intelligence to surface the most impactful coaching opportunities in real time. So no matter where your team is working from, the Ring DNA platform can help them exponentially increase call connections, opportunities, and revenue. Learn more at ringdna.com slash platform. That's ringdna.com slash platform.